And so now, it's a pleasure to welcome to studio Jason Greenblatt, former White House Middle East envoy and author of In the Path of Abraham. Shelley Tal Meron, member of the Israeli parliament from the Yesh Atid party, and still with us, our senior diplomatic correspondent, Owen Altman. Thank you all so much for being here in studio. And Jason Greenblatt, I'm going to start with you because you are here in the country and have just, on day 89 of this war, been to Kfar Aza in the south, one of the parts of southern Israel hardest hit by the Hamas terror rampage. Your thoughts, your perspective? First of all, nothing can prepare you for what I saw. You could read about it, you could watch the videos, you could watch images on television. It's absolutely horrific. But w of course I went there to support Israel, but I brought a Palestinian with me. One of the reasons I brought him is that there are so many lies going around the world. In the Arab world, in America, on the left, people are saying it didn't happen. October 7th didn't happen. Israel's exaggerating. You had the story in the New York Times about the sexual assault. I did my first TikTok video it's just encouraging people to read the New York Times article. TikTok took it down, right? There's too much lying going around. So I wanted people to hear from this Palestinian what he thought about it. I'm going to release a video in the coming days, but uh, it's really important. You've got to keep people going there. You've got to keep influencers going, government officials and ordinary people so they can understand the atrocities that happened there. Give us your sense, though, of what it was like to be there. You say nothing could prepare you. What stood out for you, your emotions? Um, you know, you walk into the homes and you see the utter destruction. You see uh, there's no more blood. They've, they've cleaned everything up. But you just, uh, I noticed the plants. Uh, today happened to be a beautiful spring day. I plant with my kids. We're gardening. You see the beauty, the serenity of the place. And you just can't even fathom how somebody could come and do that to ordinary people, to civilians, to women, to children, uh, to babies. It's, um, it's not something that I ever saw, thought I'd see in my lifetime, and certainly not in 2023. We live in the modern world. Who behaves like that? It really brought me back to the Stone Ages. And Shelley, I want to bring you in on exactly that, because it's staggering to think that 89 days in, despite the evidence, despite the footage, despite the people going to see firsthand what happened, and despite the many, many testimonials and accounts of what happened, that there are reports like the one in the New York Times casting doubt over what actually happened, specifically when it came to the sexual assaults on women and girls on that day. I completely agree, and I must say, you know, when before the war I was a women's rights advocate, right? I, I would talk about it all the time and since this horrible war occurred since October 7th, I've been fighting women's rights organizations around the world because they're so silent. They don't speak up, they don't speak on behalf of the women who were sexually assaulted, who were raped, who were amputated, who were, really suffered horrific, horrific uh, crimes against humanity. And I must say, I spoke today at the Knesset about the article in the New York Times, and I encourage everybody to read this article. I must say, it took me three days to read the whole article because it was so graphic and the evidence was so horrific. I had to stop and go back to the article and read it because it was too much for me and I spoke about it today at the Knesset because you know I, one of the one of the m most horrific things that I I felt was the story about the woman in the black dress which the whole world is speaking about because there was a video that was on social media and this young woman who was murdered and her husband was murdered as well and they left two little children orphans and she was raped and nobody asked her permission to talk about the fact that she was raped. Usually when women are sexually assaulted, it takes years until they can talk about it or even complain about it. And this woman, she wasn't only murdered, she was raped and nobody asked for her permission to talk about what she went through. It's horrible. Why, Jason, the silence from women's groups, specifically in the United States? Why the celebrities that are so outspoken in so many other cases around the globe, why the muted response comparatively from the US at this juncture? Your thoughts? 
Well, they're hypocritical. They hate Jews. But I want to add something to what Shelley said, which is so much of the criticism is just based on a false reality. Some of the criticism is, but there are no survivor, there are no testimonies of the rape survivors. It's because they're all dead, right? The few that are still alive are, are too traumatized to do it. So they're saying because there's no first-hand testimony and everything is second-hand testimony, they're asking for dead people to testify. It's obscene. It's absurd. It's horrific. The Hamas spokesman Basim Nayem claiming Western media and news agencies are, quote, biased when it comes to what it calls Israeli propaganda, lies about Palestinian resistance, also calling the attacks on the 7th of October glorious. You were on the scene today in Kfar Aza. What kind of response do you have when you hear that kind of rhetoric when more than 1,200 people were butchered, shot, mutilated, burnt, and that is the response, a glorious day in the eyes of some. I would say this, ignore them, right? They're haters, they have hate in their heart, you're never gonna convince them. But there are a lot of other people who just don't understand, who are being convinced by the wrong people. Those are the people that we have to talk to, those are the people we have to reach. And when you see this video of the Palestinian, who isn't 100% saying everything I'd love him to say, he's honest, he's emotional about it, he condemned it. Those are the kind of people that we have to touch, people that want a better future, people that are willing to be honest. The crazy people who say crazy things, ignore them. They're terrible people. Bayem Naim, that same man to the New York Times, saying that women were recipients of good treatment they had experienced on October the 7th and that accounts given by hostages released, the female hostages, also reflect that they were well treated. Now, Shelley, you are wearing a necklace. It's in support of the hostages still at this moment, 129 hostages are still being held in Gaza, including women, including children. When you hear that, you hear that account, the suggestion that these hostages accounts depicted a favorable situation and treatment inside captivity, what is your response? Well, it's outrageous, really. These people were taken out of their beds on a Saturday morning, 6.30 in the morning, or from a music festival, and taken into hostage to Gaza. Innocent people, civilians, who were kidnapped and kept in horrible conditions. No medical care, the Red Cross has not visited them, we've all spoken about it uh, everywhere. And horrible conditions, hardly any food, hardly any water. The women that came back from captivity spoke about the horrible conditions they were held, about the fear, how fearful they were from rape, how they were looking at them, some of them were touching them, and there are testimonies about things that are going on there, and we are very concerned about the women who are still there. Of course, the men, the children, the elderly, everyone, but the women, are, we've already seen that they've used war crimes, they use sexual assault as, as war weapons. So of course the, it's outrageous to hear that they were kept in good conditions. These are civilians who were, should have never been taken into Gaza. And I, of course I'm wearing the dog tag, I've been wearing it from the day that it, was, that it was given to me. And we need these 129 people to come back home now, alive. Jason, your thoughts, given your experience on relations between Israel and Arab nations in this part of the world, who are the players, if any, right now, who could pressurize Qatar and by extension Hamas to make sure that the hostages firstly are seen to by the Red Cross, and secondly, that they do get to come home safely. We know it's complicated. There is no doubt that factors developing right now up north in the Gaza Strip are complicating issues. There's no doubt about that. But there are players who could be putting pressure on Qatar to pressurize Hamas to do something so, as you say, Shelley, these hostages can get home to their loved ones. Uh, I don't think there's anyone that could pressure them more than what's already happening. I think the Biden administration is pressuring Qatar. I think Qatar itself is working very hard. I was there two weeks ago. I met some of these people. I met the prime minister. They're working very, very hard. What did they tell you? They, they're trying to get Hamas to behave, and Hamas just is not listening. Are and they, it gets more. Uh, please. No, go ahead, please. Are they worried about the fallout? for their own reputation from this war? Or how worried are they about the fallout? I think they're reputation? worried, but I also think they believe, and, and I understand their point, that they're being painted as Hamas, which they're not. 
So I think they're trying their best to do something. Uh, they're not as successful as we all had hoped, as I think they had hoped. But it's very hard to negotiate with terrorists. Exactly. So um, I can't blame them. And I'm telling you, I see dark circles under their eyes. They are working very, very hard to do it. But I think it's not so much the pressure, and which is to your question as well. It's how do we all band together? Israel, the United States, the Gulf countries, all of our allies and friends. Um, all of us should be demanding this. And, and nobody should be standing with anyone who is remotely trying to support Hamas. Uh, it's, it's a huge problem. And I, and I don't blame Qatar for it. They didn't cause the problem. Uh, you know, whatever they did was with Israel's involvement. We could talk about a future. A policy that doesn't involve giving Gaza money. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in Gaza? But I will say one more thing because I think it's important. Throughout the Arab countries, Qatar, UAE, Arab, um, Saudi Arabia, all of them, there's not a single person who talks like the haters. They all understand the atrocities. They all understand who the enemy is. Uh, even my, my business associates and colleagues, they all called me after October 7th to express sorrow, to explain how they stand with you know, they stand in horror against what happened. So there's a dichotomy between the people on social media and the people who report on Al Jazeera who say these crazy, hateful things. And I would say the ordinary people in the Gulf who are just as horrified about what's going on as we are. Ishmael Khania and several other Hamas leaders, including Saleh al Haruri, who was killed in Beirut overnight, are shown praying on the 7th of October, watching on their screens the atrocities unfolding. My understanding is they're in Qatar doing that. I saw that video and I, I understood from that as well. And that should change for sure going forward. Maybe it was a mistake going backward, meaning everybody thought having them in Qatar would be the right approach. Now we have to ask ourselves, well, if we ask Qatar to remove them, which is probably the right decision, where do we send them? Let's drop them in Gaza. Who cares, right? We will lose any leverage over them, but it's probably the right decision. It's a horrible scene. It's a just it's it's just the worst possible scene. They're praying there. It's on our screens see, right now. You can see enjoying, it right now. They're probably laughing. I bet you they're going to drink wine and do other things that are against Islam after it. It's a terrible scene. Can I ask a question? What is the relationship? Obviously, there is a lot of fog of war now and fog over the day after. But what does the relationship between Israel and Qatar look like on the day after? I have a crazy theory. I'm oh, we have room for off the wall theories and predictions. Would Qatar normalize with Israel as a way of getting out, of, of, of trying to improve its reputation in the West? Is that a way out for them? And is that something that's worth it for Israel to pursue? I definitely think it would be worth pursuing it. Qatar, for its small size, packs a big punch in the world, on the world stage today. Um, look, let's remember they were the first to, in a way, I don't want to say normalize, but open a liaison office. I think we could get there again, and I think that's why it's important to strengthen that relationship. There's certainly a lot of policy changes that have to happen, but deep down I think they understand that you're, they are a, under threat the same way Israel is under threat, and I think we have to figure out how to move more pieces together to align with Israel and the United States against the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime wants to take over every one of those countries. They may want to destroy Israel, but they want to take over the those countries, including Qatar. I think if we don't take advantage of trying to work with them and bring them over to our side, um, and part of them are on our side, right? They're not enemies of Israel. They're just pro-Palestinian and uh, not ready to normalize with Israel until there's some sort of Palestinian uh, deal, a deal that I wouldn't accept that I don't think Israel would accept. But I think we need to bring them closer and closer. Your take on the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Israel going forward. Clearly, through the Crown Prince himself, he was saying ahead of October, each day was one step closer to some level of normalization. Clearly, that has been scuppered for now. But your sense of what that could look like potentially down the line? I remain optimistic after the war. I mean, if your viewers haven't seen the Crown Prince's interview on Fox News with Brett Baer in English, it's worth watching. What he said, he means. I spent a significant amount of time with him. And he is a very forward-looking leader. And I think after this war, he will hopefully pick up the pieces, whether it's with President Biden, somebody else. I think he asked for quite a number of important things for Saudi Arabia, challenging for the United States, challenging for Israel, for sure, maybe more challenging for Israel now, depending on what he demands for the Palestinians. But I'm, I remain optimistic with a leader like him, and with all the leaders, by the way, in the Gulf. I think each one of them, I can't speak to Kuwait, I didn't do much with Kuwait, 
But uh, Qatar, the UAE, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, I think there's tremendous promise there. And I look forward to the day after this calms down a little bit, where we'll be going back to back and forth between the UAE and all these countries in Israel the way I go to Miami Beach. Shelley, your thoughts on exactly that, the role that could be played in the day after, as we keep on talking about, the day after this war, the players that could be involved here to help this region, it's going to take a long time. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, I was very happy to hear um, what he mentioned. And of course, I think the state of Israel has shown before that it wants to normalize its relationship with different countries around the world. And we were making progress. Progress. We had the Abraham Accords, and um, we truly want to progress with that. But right now, we have to concentrate on defeating Hamas, um, eradicating Hamas, and bringing our hostages back. And we will have time to normalize our relationships with different countries around the world. We need to concentrate on the goal right now. But it could be an opportunity for the state of Israel, and I hope it will be. I just want to say, obviously, that's true. But, but going to the day after the normalization, incredible to hear what you have to say. I, I think it's important for us to continue to pursue normalization, including with Qatar, maybe on, again, with policies that need to change. But just, just, can, just looking at the interest that each of the countries has, uh, if there's some future that's a different kind of future, of course with Saudi Arabia that we rightly spent so much time talking about and that has had and has so much promise, uh, but beyond as well. I need to pivot right now to another concerning development over and above what is happening here in the region is the global reaction and specifically in the United States, Jason on United States campuses, some of the most elite campuses. I know something that is very close to the heart of our Owen Altman, Claudine Gay resigning, the Harvard president. It took some time for that to happen, but your sense of the core issue on those campuses, why we are seeing the situation unfolding the way it has, it certainly came as a surprise to many in this part of the world. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, we failed. When I say we in the American Jewish community, Israel, we didn't explain our story, Israel's story, properly. And we ended up being overtaken by the Palestinian um, PR massive machine, which they've been funded and doing for decades. The second thing is we came into like the woke left, which was a problem. But look what's happened, right? It's not just Claudine Gay, the president of Penn. I'll cross my fingers about the president of MIT. But there were people out there who spoke up rapidly, people like Mark Rowan, Bill Ackman. There were so many heroes to this story. Um, they, you know, at uh, least Stefanik, right? I'm sure all your viewers saw that day in Congress. We know her well now. <laughs> right. She did a remarkable job. We can't be afraid of telling our story. For years, we, we were just not doing it right. We have to do it and do it, and we'll continue to see this kind of progress. But only if we remain strong only if we fight the people who are lying and only if we tell our truth which is the truth your thoughts it's all true but there's also a huge element of this and you see this in the second day on the day after to, to use that that uh, well uh, trodden phrase uh, after Claudine Gay re resigned that there are elements of this that are just bigger than Israel and bigger than American Jews. And that's the frustrating part of this, right? The whole debate over the DEI apparatus, diversity, equity, and inclusion apparatus in these campuses, over the tilt of these campuses politically, the changing demographics of America, the changing demographics of the campuses. This debate really isn't about us. It, we were just the catalyst. October 7th dropped into it was already a simmering situation and just brought it to more of a boil. And in a sense, Israel and American Jew, Jewry, I think, were, were in a sense taken hostage by all of this, and no more so now because the narrative, of course, predictable on the second day, it was the billionaire donors who brought down the first black woman president of Harvard, right? I didn't use the word Jewish in that sentence, but I think that's well understood by many of the people who are saying it, and even more so the people who, who are listening to it. And of course, what's even What's behind this as well is the fight over American Jews' place in the American elite, right? The percentage of Jewish students at Harvard College and at the colleges and the Ivy League, especially Penn, right, whose president also resigned, has dropped dramatically in the last 10 to 20 years. And I think that just concern among American Jews that I hear, again, read between the lines of what is American Jews' place in, in this changing America. Uh, so there are issues that are about America much more than they are about Israel. But of course, that shouldn't stop us from doing what we can, again, 
to fight the fight, to get our words out without shutting anybody down, with allowing the widest possible free speech. I personally feel strongly about that. But of course, using that free speech also to our own advantage, to be able to make our case. And, and I, I, I said it on the, the day after the hearing that it was, there was a sense in which I think Claudine Gay was being scapegoated for American Jews' own failures. But on the other hand, the amount of funding for some of these Middle Eastern studies departments was so enormous and happened over so many years that one wonders if American Jews could have effectively competed with it. But we faced larger enemies in the past as a smaller people and, and been able to succeed. So there may be a path forward, but the part that really concerns me, there are elements of this that aren't about us and that, that we can't change. That's also the issue of the polling among, among young Americans as well. Uh, but certainly shouldn't stop Israelis and, and Jewish students from fighting the fight. Shelley, I want to bring you in on exactly that, because over and above the issue at various campuses, we have seen anti-Israel protest action in several parts of the globe, and some of them, the rhetoric has been diabolical. The banners, the shouting, people taking down posters of hostages. It's difficult to see it, and it happened immediately after October 7th. Your thoughts on what triggered that kind of reaction in so many parts of the globe? Well, unfortunately, I think we've neglected, in many cases, um, our story, as was mentioned here before. You know, I lived in Philadelphia. I know Penn. I was accepted there and I was supposed to do my BA there and then I decided to come back to Israel and I did my BA here but That's I know okay this now. university <laughs> yeah but I know this uni university in this area and I think that the state of Israel has to put some resources to uh, educate around the campuses in the United States and around the world by the way in Europe as well not just the US but I think that there's a lot of ignorance going around when you hear people chanting from the river to the sea uh, Palestine will be free they have no idea which river and which sea. The ignorance is, is, is unbelievable. Staggering. Staggering. And I see within my social media, because I speak in English many times, I see that the comments there, a lot of ignorance going on. We need to believe in our story. We need to tell our story. We need to be proud and not be afraid to tell uh, our story. And we need to invest, as a state, we need to invest in explaining our story, our history, the conflict, and uh, the fact that Israel is a peace-seeking country. And that's the difference between a terror organization and a government and a state that wants to normalize its relationships with its neighbors. You mentioned social media, Jason, at the start of this discussion. You have seen some of the trending topics, the trending footage, the fake news as well. When you talk about telling the truth, telling the real story, how do you suggest people should be doing that right now? Very briefly, please. I have six kids. I tell them they got to read everything. Social media, find trusted people on social media, read all the newspapers, because it's the only way you'll be able to triangulate and get a great story. May I add just one thing to what Shelley said? Until this war, Israel has not done a great job with its PR. On this war, They've trotted out a bunch of very compelling English-speaking um, people to speak about the war and to speak the truth. They've done a great job. They need to continue to do that, to tell the story. And on that very positive note, we say a huge thank you to our panel, Jason Greenblatt, former White House Middle East envoy and author of In the Path of Abraham, Shelley Talmeron, member of the Israeli parliament from the Yesh Party. Thank you both so much. 